Holborn House supplier was a man named Boris Stepanovich. He was the one who brought us the food we needed. The bars of soap, the towels, the odd pieces of equipment. He showed up as often as four or five times a week, delivering the things we asked for, and then carrying off yet another treasure from the Woburn estate. A china pot, for instance, a violin or picture frame. All of the objects that had been stored in the fifth floor rooms and that continued to provide the cash that kept Woburn House running. Boris Stepanovich had been on the scene for a long time, Victoria told me, ever since the period of Dr. Woburn's original settlers. The two men had apparently known each other for many years before that, and given what I learned about the doctor, it surprised me that he should have been friends with such a dubious character as Boris Stepanovich. I believe it had something to do with the fact that the doctor had once saved Boris's life, but it might have been the other way around. I heard several different versions of the story and could never be sure which one was true. Boris Stepanovich was a plump, middle-aged man who seemed almost fat by the standard of the city. He had a taste for flamboyant clothes, fur hats, walking sticks, bonnet trees, and in his round, leathery face, there was something that reminded me of an Indian chief. Everything he did had a certain flair to it, even the way he smoked cigarettes, pulling them tightly between his thumb and index finger, inhaling the smoke with an elegant, upside-down, nonchalant, and then releasing it through his bulky nostril-like streams from a boiling kettle. It was often difficult to follow him in conversation. However, as I got to know him better, I learned to expect a good deal of confusion. He was fond of obscure pronouncements and elliptical allu allusions, and he embellished simple remarks with such ornate imagery that you could soon get lost trying to understand him. Boris had an aversion at being pinned down, and he had used language as an instrument of locomotion, constantly on the move, darting, encircling, disappearing, and suddenly appearing again in a different spot. At one time or another, he told me so many stories about himself, presented so many conflicting accounts of his life that I gave up trying to believe anything. One day he would assure me that he had been born in the city and he had lived there all his life. The next day, as if having forgotten his previous story, he would tell me that he had been born in Paris. Then shifting course yet again, he would confuse me with another real story, owning to some unpleasant difficulties with the Turkish police in his youth. He had taken on another identity. Since then, he had changed his name so many times that he could no longer remember what his real name was. No no matter, he said, a man must live for the moment to moment, and if you know who you are today. Originally, he said, he himself had never married, or else he had been married three times, depending on which version served his purpose at the moment. Whenever Boris Stepanovich launched into one of his personal histories, it was always so something to prove some other point or some other, as if by resorting to his own experience, he could claim final authority on any given subject. For that reason, he had also held every imaginable job, from the humblest manual work to the most exalting executive position. He had been a dishwasher, a juggler, a car salesman, a literature professor, a pickpocket, a real estate broker, a newspaper editor, and the manager of a large department store that specialized in women's fashion. I am no doubt forgetting others, but you begin to get the idea. Boris Stepanovich never really expected you to believe what he said, but at the same time, he did not treat his inventions as lies. They were part of an almost con conscious plan to concoct a more pleasant world for himself, a world that could shift according to his whims, that was no subject to the same laws and bleak necessities that dragged down all the rest of us, a realist in the strict sense of the word, quite the cunning blowhard he appeared to be, and underneath his bluff and hardiness, there was always a hint of something else, and perhaps a sense of some deep deeper understanding. I would not go so far as to say he was a good person, but Boris had his own set of rules, and he stuck to them. Unlike everyone else I had met here, he managed to float above his circumstances. Starvation, murder, the worst forms of cruelty, he walked right by them, and even though then, and yet always appeared unscathed, it was as though he had imagined every possibility in advance, and therefore he was never surprised by what happened. Inherent in his attitude was a pessimism, so deep, so devastating, so fully in tune with the facts. Boris Stepanovich was probably good medicine for me, and I began looking forward to our little excursions where he found the food for Woburn House. He would take me through the back alleys and deserted paths, stepping neatly over the grunted pavement, navigating the numerous hazards and pitfalls. I tell you this in all modesty. If you had been able to see me then, you would understand how this is possible. I find a link to the past. Treat it gently, my friend. You're holding my memories in your hand.
The trick, I think, was his ability to make inert things come to life, whether these stories were true or not. Once Boris's voice began working, it was enough to muddle the issue entirely. That voice was probably his greatest weapon. He possessed a severe range of modulations and timbers, and in his speeches he always looping back and forth between hard sounds and soft, allowing the words to rise and fall as they poured out in a dense, intricately fashioned barrage of syllables. Boris had a weakness for phrases and literary sentiments, and but for all of the deadness of the language and the stories were remarkably vivid. Delivery meant everything, and Boris did not hesitate to use every, even the lowest tricks, if necessary. He would cry real tears. If the situation called for it, he would smash an object on the floor. Once to prove his faith in the set of fragile-looking glasses, he juggled them in the air for better than five minutes. And I always, and I was always slightly embarrassed for these performances. But there was no question that they were. Value is determined by supply and demand, after all. And the demand for a precious antiques were hardly very great. Only the rich could afford them. The black market profiteers, the garbage brokers, the resurrection agents themselves, and it would have been wrong for Boris to insist on their utility. The whole point was that they were extravagances, things to possess because they functioned as symbols of wealth and power. Hence the stories about the countess and the French dukes. When you brought an antique vase from Boris Stefanovich, you are not just getting a vase, you are getting an entire world to go along with it. Boris's apartment was in a, was in a small building on a turquoise avenue, not more than 10 minutes from Woolburn House after completing our business with the resurrection agents. We often went back there for a glass of tea. Boris was very fond of tea and usually served some kind of pastry to go along with it. Scandalous treats from the House of Cakes on Windsor Boulevard, cream puffs, cinnamon buns, chocolate and clair eclairs, all bought at horrific expense. Boris could not resist these minor indulgences, however, and he savored them slowly. His chewing accompanied by a faint musical rumbling in his throat, a steady undercurrent of sound that fell somewhere between laughter and a prolonged sigh. I took pleasure in these teas as well, but less for the food than for Boris' insistence on sharing it with me. My young widow friend is too wan, he would say. We must put more flesh on her bones, bringing the bloom, the bloom back to her cheeks, the bloom in the eyes of Miss Anne Bloom herself. It was hard for me not to enjoy such treatments, and there were times when I sensed that all Boris's indulgences were more than um, shards of his performances for my benefit. One by one, he took on the roles of clown and scoundrel philosopher, but the better I got to know him, the more I saw them as aspects of a single personality and various weapons in an effort to bring me back to life. We became dear friends, and I owe Boris a debt for, his, for the devious and persistent attack he launched on the strongholds of my sadness. The apartment was a shabby, three-room affair, cluttered with years of accumulation throughout crockery, clothes, suitcases, blankets, rugs, every manner of brick brack immediately upon returning home, Boris would withdraw to his bedroom and change out of his suit. This last item was a rather fantastical souvenir from the bygone days, full-length concoction made of red velvet, cuffs completely ragged by now, with moth holes in the sleeves and a frayed material all along the back. But Boris wore it with his customary, after slicking back the strands with his thinnest hair and dough, dough his neck with cologne. He would come striding out into the cramped and dusty living room to prepare the tea. For the most part, he regaled me with stories of his life, but there were other times when he would look at various things in a room and talk about them. The boxes of curiosity, the bizarre little treasures. Boris was particularly proud of his hat collection, which he stored in a large wooden trunk by the window. I don't know how many he had in there, but there were two or three dozen, I think. Perhaps more. Sometimes he would pick out a couple of them for us to wear while we were having our tea. This game amused him very much. I admit that I enjoy it myself, although I would be hard-pressed to explain why. There were cowboy hats and derbies and motor car hats and every other kind of hats you can imagine. Even when I asked Boris why he collected, he would give me a different answer. Once he said that wearing hats was a part of his religion. Another time he explained that each of his hats had once belonged to a relative and that he had worn them in order to commune with the souls of the dead, an ancestor. By putting on a hat, he acquired the spiritual qualities of his former owner. The former owner. True enough, he had given each of his hats a name, but I took those more as projections of his private feelings about the hats than a representation of the people who actually lived. The Fez. 
for example, was of his uncle's. The derby was of Sir Charles. The motor car hat was of Professor Solomon. On still another occasion, however, when I brought up the subject again, Boris exclaimed that he liked to wear hats because they kept his thoughts from flying out of his head. We both wore them while we drank our tea. Then we were bound to have more intelligent and stimulating conversations. There was only one time when Boris ever seemed to let his guard down to go back to Woburn House. Boris was in an oddly pensive mood. For the better part of the visit, I had done most of the talking. Just when I finally mustered the courage to put on my coat and say goodbye, I remember the smell of damp wool, the reflections of the candles in the window, and the cave-like interior of the movement. moment. Boris reached out for my hand and held it tightly on his own, looking up at me with a grin, enigmatic smile. You must understand it's all an illusion, my dear, he said. I am not sure I know what you mean, Boris. Wilburn House. It's built on foundations of cloud. It seems perfectly solid to me. I'm there every day, you know, and then the house has never moved. It has never wobbled. For now, yes, but give it a little time and then you'll see what I'm talking about. How much time is it? A little time. However long it takes. The fifth floor room can hold only so much, you understand, and sooner or later there won't be anything left to sell. The stock is growing thin already, and once a thing is gone, there's no way of getting it back. That's so terrible. Everything ends, Boris. I don't see why Woburn House shouldn't be any different. It's fine for you to say that, but what happens with poor Victoria? Victoria isn't stupid. I'm sure she's she thought about these things herself. Victoria is stubborn. She also holds out the last glot has been spent and she'll be no better off than the people she's been trying to help. Isn't that her business? Yes or no? I promised her father that I would look after her, and I'm not about to break my word. If only you could have seen her when she was young. I'm surprised at you, Boris. You sound like a rank sentimentalist. We all speak our own language of ghosts, I'm afraid. I'm reading the handwriting on the wall, and none of them encourages me. The Woburn House funds will run out. I have additional resources in this apartment, of course. And here Boris made a sweeping gesture that took in all of the objects in the room. Unless we begin to look ahead, there won't be much future for us anyway. What are you trying to say? Make plans? Consider the possibilities? Act? And you expect Victoria to go along with it? Not necessarily. If I have you on my side, at least there's a chance. What makes you think I could have any influence on her? The eyes in my head. I see what's going on over there, and Victoria has never responded to any anyone the way she has to you. She's positively smitten. We're just friends. There's more to it than that, my dear. A great deal more. I don't know what you're talking about. You will. Sooner or later, you'll understand every word I've said. I guarantee it.